Laney is the Harold and Matthew Buxbaum Professor of Pediatrics, Medicine, Surgery, and in the college. Uh, he's also the Associate Director of the McLean Center, and which he co-directs the Ethics Council Service. Um, Laney has published two books on pediatric ethics, one on children, families, and healthcare decisions, uh, the other on children and medical research, uh, both uh, published by Oxford. Um, he's working on a third book on the genetic, uh, genetic testing and screening of infants and children. Uh, Laney is a trained philosopher uh, as well as a practicing pediatrician, and she combines the philosophical and clinical skills in her research work, often integrating a theory with empirical data. Uh, her theoretical work often fo focuses on policy matters, um, and she works to develop real-world uh, solutions to these problems. Currently, she serves on the Committee of Bioethics of the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the talk today is called Challenging the Professionalism Movement in the U.S. So the first caveat is that these thoughts are preliminary. Mark did move my presentation up by four months. I'm not arguing against professionalism, understood to mean clinically competent physicians who practice ethical medicine, nor am I objecting to teaching clinical competency and ethics. I am objecting to the professionalism movement in which we are, one, proclaiming lofty ideals as professionalism, teaching ethics and etiquette without a framework. And so that's what the focus of this talk is going to be. It's going to be talking about what professionalism really is or ought to be and where we've gone wrong. Um, I do have to mention one conflict of interest. So rare for okay. uh, My conflict is I'm actually an author, not the lead author, on the American Academy of Pediatrics Professionalism Statement of Principles. Despite my role, which I'll discuss, I'll actually criticize the document. So, I have three objectives for today's talk. The first is to analyze... Show us what that sounds like. <laughs> Good, so I'm representing myself. It's not my point here today. Um, so I'm going to analyze the professionalism documents of the American Board of Internal Medicine and the American Academy of Pediatrics. I'm going to evaluate current pediatric residency educational curriculum regarding professionalism and ethics. And then I'm going to consider how current trends like social media challenge our understanding of ethics and professionalism. So the physician charter of, in 2002 was actually a collaboration by the American Board, of, uh, American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation with the American College of Physicians, the American Society of Internal Medicine Foundation, and the European Federation of Internal Medicine. And their goal was to write a document titled Medical Professionalism in the New Millennium, a physician charter. And this physician charter set out three fundamental principles the principle of primacy of patient welfare, the principle of patient autonomy, and the principle of social justice. I want to compare those three principles to the underlying principles of the Belmont Report, which are respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. And so there are two changes from Belmont to the physician charter. Anybody notice them? I'll give you a hint. I'll put it back up there. What do you think has changed? Right, so we move from respect for persons to respect for autonomy, and we change the lexical order, both of which are a big mistake. So let me explain why. Belmont Report in 1979 was uh, written by the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects and Biobehavioral and Biomedical Research, and probably one of the best biomedical ethics documents of the 20th century. Um, and so I actually criticized this in a paper that I've already published. And what, why am I so upset about this shift from respect for persons to respect for autonomy? The first is, what do we mean when we use the phrase, or when Belmont used the phrase respect for person? It actually had two components. The first is respect for the person's autonomy, 
But there was a second component integral to that, which was respect for the pe person's welfare, particularly for those who lack decisional capacity. So this notion of just having primacy of autonomy, in a sense, ignores all of those who lack decisional capacity. So those who are vulnerable because they're children or because they have developmental disabilities of one sort or another. Uh, and language matters. The shift from respect for persons to respect for autonomy, I would argue, is actually impoverished how we treat patients. I was at a conference this morning where I heard, well, the patient was found to have decisional, uh, decisional capacity and refused treatment until we let her die. I mean, that was how it was described this morning. That's a problem because it failed to acknowledge that there has to be also a concern for this patient's welfare. Um, so I'm going to actually argue that the, Here's one mistake with the professionalism movement, right? We're trying to resume our professional responsibility and reinstate our obligation to respect our patients in person and not just to respect their autonomy. So why the lexical shift? Notice that in Belmont, it's respect for persons and then beneficence, and here we're putting welfare or beneficence above autonomy. And the reason for the shift is in part because of this shift in language. Um, but it assumes, then, that patient welfare is some objective fact. And what we know is in an adopt-patient relationship, determining what is in a patient's welfare is actually a negotiation between the doctor and the patient. And so this professionalism charter, though, because it uses autonomy, has to put welfare first. But if you still had this notion of respect for persons, it would be respect for persons before you got to the issue <coughs> of the patient's welfare. So again, two mistakes before we even get past the first three principles. Um, and so again, I, now I want to look at these three principles and see how they're actually defined in the document. Um, so I'm going to actually argue that two of these principles are too demanding. So first I'm going to look at how they define patient welfare and social justice, and then I'll actually argue that they're uh, too lenient on patient autonomy. But let's look at how they define patient welfare. And this is quoted right from the physician charter. This principle is based on a dedication to serving the interests of the patient. Altruism contributes to the trust that is essential to the physician-patient relationship. Market forces, societal pressures, and administrative ex exigencies must not compromise this principle. And then they go on to define altruism as putting the interests of others first, involving self-sacrifice. So in a paper that I had written, actually, at around the same time, we asked the question, are doctors altruistic? And I wrote this with a colleague, Walter Wannick. We actually argued that one of the most fundamental features of medical professionalism is actually a fiduciary responsibility based on trust to patient. And it uh, applies a duty or obligation to act in a patient's best interest. Um, and we use the language then of fiduciary and not of altruism. In fact, we argued very specifically that the problem is, is that altruism suggests that it's supererogatory or going beyond obligations, and that um, you can be altruistic in a relationship in which there is no relationship. But in the doctor-patient relationship, where you have a relationship, you actually have obligations. And so we don't want to be saying to doctors, be professional by being supererogatory. We want to see that professionalism is part of their duties. In fact, in this paper, we did a fun twist. We actually argued that it was the patients who are sometimes altruistic. It's the patient who lets the medical student try the LP, even though the medical student admits it's their first time. It's the patient who agrees to be a living donor for another family member. It's not us who are being the altruist. And we argued, and we concluded in our paper, that if it is patients and not the doctors who are altruistic, then the patients are the gift bearers. And to that extent, doctors owe them gratitude and respect for their many contributions to medicine. Recognizing this might help us better understand the moral significance of the doctor-patient relationship in modern medicine. <coughs> um, so again, I mean, basically my conclusion here is that altruism is too demanding and inappropriate in a fiduciary relationship. Now let's look at their second principle that I want to say is too demanding, which is the principles of social justice. And again, I'm quoting, although I've added some of the power. The medical profession must promote justice in the healthcare system, including the fair distribution of healthcare resources. Physicians should work actively to eliminate discrimination in healthcare, whether based on race, gender, socioeconomic status, ethnicity, religion, or any other social category. 
So notice, we're supposed to be working actively to get rid of discrimination and social inequities. And then my first question is, does this apply locally, nationally, internationally, and is this a requirement for every physician or just for physicians as a group? And um, I'm sorry, it, it seems to have come off from the changing of computers. But basically, my argument is going to be that I'm not convinced that each of us individually are actually working for that. But I'm going to talk about that after they give the three principles, they then actually give another 10 professional responsibilities. And one of them is commitment to improving access to care, which I would argue fits along with this principle of social justice. And as the charter explains, a commitment to equity entails the promotion of public health and preventive medicine, as well as public advocacy on the part of each physician, emphasis, without concern for the self-interest of the physician or the profession. So who serves the underserved would be the first question I would want to know, because if all of us have an obligation, the answer is we should see 100% on every single one of these, and we're not going to. So here was a study done in 2000 published in 2006, although the survey was done in 2001. And what you see is, I would say commendably, three quarters of the physicians said, I personally want to be involved in providing care for the medically needy during my medical career. And only 25, but only 25% said physicians should volunteer their time working in a free clinic. Um, and then 87% disagreed with this statement, physicians should not be concerned about the problems of the medically needy. So we have about three quarters of the physicians actually expressing at least attitudes about taking care of those um, who have less. If you look at behaviors, they uh, say physicians provide charity care, you had 79.88%, and physicians had participated in national or international aid missions, you had less than 10%. So clearly, um, another study that was done looked at the percent of physicians providing charity care. And the one thing that's really noticeable is the percent of physicians who are providing charity care is decreasing over time. And part of that can be the economy. So if every physician is obligation to social justice and one third of us who aren't providing any charity care are failing, and if the medical community is obligations to actively, remember it's not just providing, it's actively eliminate social inequities, then we all fail. Which again is why I feel that this professionalism doc doctrine is just lofty ideal. So now let's look back at these three principles. And now I want to focus on patient autonomy and say that the physician charter here may not be demanding enough. Because here's what they wrote. Physicians must have respect for patient autonomy. Physicians must be honest with their patients and empower them to make informed decisions about their treatment. Patients' decisions about their care must be paramount and the italics are mine. As long as those decisions are in keeping with ethical practice and do not lead to demand for inappropriate care. And so why do I have this in italics? My first is, decisions are in keeping with ethical practice. Does this mean that conscience clauses can or cannot override legitimate patient requests? Because that would be one way that they may have a quote, uh, legitimate request that's going to be overridden or at least ignored. And then I have to ask the question, who defines what is inappropriate care? Is inappropriate defined by clinicians or utilization review committees? Or is inappropriate care based on evidence-based medicine? And are these boundaries decided by individual physicians or physicians as a group? And is there any negotiation or, in a sense, what recourse does the patient have if they feel their care is appropriate and the physician deems it inappropriate? So in other words, I've now rejected all three of the principles. Um, so let's move away. Maybe it's just because it was written by the internal medicine people, and I'm a pediatrician. So do the pediatricians do better? And the answer is no. Um, but here's what happens when the pediatricians decided to promote professionalism. I should say that the real process began with the American Board of Pediatrics. They uh, wrote a book. Uh, with the Association of Pediatric Program Directors called Teaching and Assessing Professionalism in 2008. And then the AAP came out with um, their own statement. And I was um, in transition on the committee. The one thing I did get out in the one part, I'm only part of one of the two AAP statements, one's a statement and one's a technical report. There's no use of the word altruism, for example, in the part that I'm involved in. And yet we did maintain the principles the three principles as uh, decided by the American Board of Internal Medicine. 
So what do you have to know about the American Board of Pediatrics project? Basically, it's an interesting thing because it was done through the medical education. They said that since 1982, pediatric residency programs have been asked to evaluate trainees for ethical behavior. And in fact, in 2007, the ACDME required documenting teaching and evaluation of professionalism. So they created this project in 2008, which was about teaching and assessing professionalism. It was a program director's guide. It was written by eight highly respected medical educators and adopts most of the physician charter. There were no ethicists on this project. And here's what the ADP wrote. There are many definitions of professionalism. For our purpose, we will use Stern's definition as highlighted in his book, Measuring Medical Professionalism. And here's his definition. Professionalism is demonstrated through a foundation of clinical competence, communication skills, and ethical understanding upon which is built the aspiration to and wise application of the principles of professionalism, excellence, humanism, accountability, and altruism. This definition emphasizes the fact that professionalism is a behavior that must be demonstrated. So remember, this was a group of pediatricians, medical educators, whose goal was how are we going to measure and evaluate behaviorism, uh, professionalism, so they define professionalism as a behavior. So is professionalism a behavior? And the answer is yes. But professionalism can be understood as much more than that. It can be understood as an attitude, an identity. It's about values, norms, attributes, motives, or tendencies. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that how we're going to conceptualize it is going to structure how we're going to teach it and how we're going to live it. Um, so contrast the more global, quote, identity conception of professionalism in medicine, which would say that teaching professionalism is not so much a particular segment of the medical curriculum as it defines, rather it is a defining dimension of medical education as a whole. So we shouldn't have it sort of, hey, this is our professionalism education and we're now done. It needs to be throughout the curriculum. We have to deal with it because we have the, quote, hidden curriculum. So um, here's another problem I have, is that once you make it a behavior that has to be taught and evaluated, um, you entrust it to the medical educators. Um, but such an approach fails to provide the analytical framework with which to examine professionalism, which is, in a sense, coming from the foundations of philosophy and medical ethics. These case-based approaches, which is what both the ABIM and the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, focus on, um, often use cases alone without theory. Um, and it allows the students, but that fails to allow the students to then take these ideas and apply them to other cases. And there have only been a few articles that actually try to evaluate, and they do <coughs> find this problem, that because it's studied in a concrete way, it's not able to be abstracted beyond. Of course, we also have to acknowledge that one of the most important behavioral components is going to be the whole issue of role modeling. And the, um, and the hidden curriculum is something we really haven't addressed so far. So the behavioral approach to professionalism, I just think, again, is just a weak understanding of professionalism. When the AAP committee decided to look at the ethics underneath it, they also enumerated the same three principles and ten responsibilities. And one of the responsibilities that they focused on was social justice and advocacy. They went even further than the American Board of Internal Medicine, so I'm going to quote, Pediatricians have a responsibility to use their knowledge, skills, and influence to advocate for children and their interests, my italics, in all domains of society, not just in health care. A child's health is broadly understood to include emotional, educational, psychological, and spiritual well-being. I've left the clinic. I'm now responsible for all children in all aspects of their daily lives. So my first question is, if I'm really supposed to be advocating, how good are physicians about advocating? And I love this article. Although physicians seem to endorse the idea of civic engagement as a professional responsibility, there's less evidence that physicians actually engage in these activities. The limited evidence available show that physicians are more likely to engage policymakers on issues affecting their own economic well-being and that on the most basic measure of civic involvement, that is voting, doctors vote less often than other professions or even the public at large. Others have observed that often a discrepancy exists between the professional values physicians endorse and the behaviors they demonstrate. And here is the data that he showed in this article showing how poorly physicians have voted in all elections, way below uh, the average uh, general public and even way below their lawyer colleagues. So 
So, and that would be the simplest form of that. <laughs> so what are pediatric residencies doing about professionalism? We actually did a survey, and Peter uh, worked with me as well as Colleen Wang, who's now at um, Wash U. Um, again, I'll give my conflict. It was partially funded by the American Academy of Pediatrics section on bioethics, um, and it was approved by the Association of Pediatric Program Directors, who agreed to distribute the survey on their lister with, in a sense, their seal of approval, uh, probably helping us get the 60% response rate that we got. Um, but neither the AAP nor the APPD had responsibility for content or data analysis. And so what did we find? <coughs> the first thing is, as I said, we did get a 60% response rate. Programs were evenly divided on whether ethics was taught as an organized curriculum or integrated throughout. Uh, professionalism was combined with the ethics curriculum in 27% of programs, taught independently in 38% of programs. But 35% had no professional curriculum, despite the fact that since 1982 it's been required in the pediatric residency program. In almost half of the programs in which faculty could be identified, we asked them, who teaches your, your ethics? Who teaches your professionalism? Um, there was no overlap between those who taught. So these are really viewed as one is in the realm of medical education and one is viewed in the range of the ethicist. And the two are rarely actually communicated. More than one third of the respondents were not able to answer questions about content and structure. So we were asking the program directors, tell us who teaches in what format. And, and they had always the option, I don't know. And for every single question, over one third was I don't know. So taking a real vested interest in what's being taught in their programs in this area. And in fact, probably two thirds of those who responded, they did that, their program dedicated 10 hours per year to ethics and professionalism respectively. <coughs> Nearly three quarters of the programs identified crowding of the curriculum, and one third identified lack of faculty expertise as their curricular constraints. So that was what we were able to show. Why are you? Why do you only give that many hours? And the main reason was for both ethics and professionalism, this crowding in the curriculum. But scarily, over one third saying they lack the expertise in their medical schools. So our conclusion was that despite requirements to train and evaluate residents in ethics and professionalism, there's a lack of structured curriculum, faculty expertise, and evaluation methodology. The effectiveness of training curriculum and evaluation tools need to be assessed if the ACGMA requirements are going to be meaning, meaningfully realized. So while the pediatric communities reduce professionalism to behavior to be measured, other movements in the last decade are further eroding professionalism. And I learned that my notion of professionalism isn't called dinosaur uh, professionalism, it's called nostalgic professionalism. <laughs> and this was complexity theory meets medical professionalism. And in nostalgic, we have the most important values are patient autonomy, again, number one, rather than respect for person, altruism, interpersonal confidence, and personal morality, with the least important things being things like lifestyle and communication. But what was fascinating was that these authors then told me that there's a concept called, an equally valid concept, called lifestyle professionalism, where autonomy, lifestyle, and personal morality are on top, and least important are altruism, social contract, social justice, professional dominance. Even better is that we have something called unreflective professionalism, <laughs> where we get autonomy, interpersonal competence, personal morality, but on the bottom we get to have social justice and social contract. And basically this article tells us that all of these are competing notions of professionalism. I'll just start with the complexity theorists are wrong. Being a physician is a privilege, not a right. If you're not willing to put social justice and other issues higher up, and you're only focused on your own needs, we have a problem. The medical profession does not define professionalism. Society does, by delegating powers and responsibilities to the profession. So again, we have it this wrong way. We think we get to define it, and in a sense, <coughs> it's really society who's giving us the privilege, and we should acknowledge it as such. So unreflective professionalism is not professionalism. <laughs> nor is lifestyle professionalism. So as I said, I'm a dinosaur. Now, <coughs> that's not to say that there have always been challenges to ethics and professionalism. But here's a famous quote, the most common criticism made at present by older practitioners 
is that young graduates have been taught a great deal about the mechanism of disease, but very little about the practice of medicine. Or to put it more bluntly, they are too scientific and do not know how to take care of patients, who said it and when. Oh, sure, yeah, that's actually Peabody, 1927. Oh. <laughs> but you're in the right century and the right uh, last half of the century, and of course, the most famous part of that paper being the last line, one of the essential qualities of the clinician is interest in humanity for the secret of the care of the patient is in caring for the patient, not can that be found in unreflective professionalism. But there are some interesting real challenges to professionalism today, and I want to talk about two of them. One of them being duty hours. I figure if I'm going to give this talk, I'm going to make sure that I insult every single person. <laughs> So now we'll look at duty hours and social media. Um, here is a uh, study which looked at the faculty views of the implication of the new duty hours. And the one thing you'll see is this one is professionalism. And what they felt was, so how does it affect, a little over 40% felt that it had no decrease in patient care, a decreased patient care, 40% thought no change. And uh, they thought over 70% thought of decreased medical knowledge. But here is what they thought about professionalism really felt that it was going to decrease what I would assume they meant nostalgic professionalism. Um, but the real issue is social media. Um, and we're going to have lots of issues with this. Um, examples of questionable behavior by healthcare professionals. There's resident blogging about a difficult patient, which the patient and the family may access. There have been cases where the Mayo Clinic surgical house officer who photographed the patient's tattoo and texted it to friends from the OR. Anybody know what body part and what it said? What? Uh, yes, he it was. Um, he it was a uh, bar owner who had tattooed on his penis the word "red hot." Um, he actually was thrown out of the residency program. There have been unprofessional behavior by medical students um, engaging in drug use documented on a social media site. So, but the social media concerns is actually bi-directional, right? Because the privacy concerns go both ways. And by that I mean that patients can learn lots of personal facts about their physicians unless you don't have, how many people here don't have a Facebook account? Okay, it's a minority, right? And, uh, and LinkedIn, and when I say Facebook, I mean all of those accounts. Um, so can physicians, one of the issues that has come up in the medical literature is whether physicians can read patient blogs. So imagine your patient has a blog and you're talking, and in it you may even talk about compliance, alternative therapy, secondary goals. And you go and try to find out about this. Now, if it's the transplant team and they learn about non-compliance, it could actually exclude the person from getting a transplant. Of course, it can get even more complicated if the person is reviewing this is a psychiatrist, right? We reveal what we want to reveal, but now, in a sense, the whole web is there. So a physician can actually have to ask permission and say, hey, by the way, you know, I'm just going to scan the web and see if uh, anything you're writing is of relevance to our doctor-patient relationship. So, um, <coughs> So we're going to have issues like this that I think that really haven't been understood by many of us who quote profess nostalgic professionalism in part because we don't really take part in this um, in this era of social media. So, but how big is the problem? They did a couple of surveys recently. Thompson et al. at the University of Florida studied Facebook, found that only about half of their medical students had it, about 12.8% of their residents. Um, they said a majority of the accounts were not private, and in some cases they were inappropriate or unprofessional content posted. Right? In 2010, they did focus groups with medical students from Washington University School of Medicine. The vast majority used Facebook. The majority were identified online by name and institution. And there were differing views of what is inappropriate to post online. All agreed HIPAA violations were wrong and that illegal activities were up were inappropriate, but there was disagreement, for example, about commenting on attending and classmates, either professional skills or attitudes. So um, the AMA actually did come out with a very interesting report looking at professionalism in the use of social media. It was uh, published in 2011 in the Journal of Clinical Ethics. I can thank Liz and Kate for getting it for me. It's fine. The boundary that exists in the patient-physician relationship is something to consider when physicians take part in social networks and post online. This boundary is the defining characteristic of the professional relationship in which respect, trust, and the patient's well-being are paramount. Give them credit, at least the word respect has finally gotten back in. And here were their recommendations. Physicians should be cognizant of standards of patient privacy and confidentiality, 
that must be maintained in all environments, including online. When using the internet for social networking, physicians should use privacy settings to safeguard personal information and content to the extent possible, but should realize that privacy settings are not absolute and that once on the internet, content is likely there permanently. If physicians interact with patients on the internet, physicians must maintain appropriate boundaries. Maybe you should have a recommended separate personal and professional online persona. Professional responsibility to address unprofessional behavior of colleagues seen online. Their recommendation to first contact your colleagues, say, hey, you're not supposed to post things about your peers. If no response, then actually they argue that it became an issue that should actually go to um, higher authorities, either at your institution or even to the licensure board. Physicians must recognize that actions online and content posted may negatively affect their reputation among patients and colleagues and may have consequences for their careers. So let me end where I began challenging the professional movement as currently interpreted. Ethics and professionalism are integral to medicine. The three fundamental principles are respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. Medicine is a co social contract between physicians, patients, and the public at large. It's a fiduciary relationship, not an altruistic one. And that while changing social, technological, and political events impact on how we behave or ought to behave as professionals, the fundamental component of the social contract endures. So I'll end there and take questions. We respect others one level because they are human beings. We respect a person because a person is human. We also respect a person for their character. We have all for certain people, respect them because of their accomplishment. And sometimes we respect people because we are afraid of them. You respect someone with a gun in the hand. So the respect can be vague. But we respect patients for their autonomy and for their individuality. But we may not even respect the person who, for example, was in the process of putting a bomb someplace or was going to kill someone, and then somebody shot him. And now this is our patient. So we may not even respect this person, but we respect the person's autonomy and being a human being. So why would be bad to replace respect with autonomy? So was everyone able to hear? So Javad's point, uh, very fairly, is that respect has many different connotations. So I was using respect in a technical sense. I was using it in the phrase respect for persons, which is clearly articulated what it's defined as in the Belmont Report. And the first is about respect for patient autonomy, but it's also about respect, respecting the patient's welfare, particularly for those who lack autonomy, and even for those who have autonomy, but may be un, in a vulnerable situation. Being sick is a vulnerable time for all of us. And so that's why it's not just about autonomy. Oh, the person said, no, I'm done. The person said no is the beginning of a conversation, and that's the difference. So, Lainey, you mentioned that this talk actually came four months before it was supposed to be given, so a work in progress. I think there were some parts of your talk which were um, pretty definitive. For example, at the end we talked about social media, you had a very clear statement about like boundaries between professional and personal personae. But there were other parts, so particularly the social justice part, where I think in some ways both what was presented in terms of the societies regarding social justice issues, and then your discussion of it um, was less clear. So let me give you an example. So you mentioned, for example, that um, the societies talked about, well, active physician advocacy and a variety of, of areas for social justice, um, but it really wasn't defined in terms of the professional charters. So in some ways, some of your critiques, I think, were potentially unfair in terms of um, uh, it, it being vague and you're sort of putting words in people's mouths. So for example, you mentioned, for example, the uncompensated care uh, slide, where you were then defining, saying, well, if, two thir if one fourth of people weren't giving uncompensated care, well, maybe they're being hypocrites. Um, or the issue about, well, you know, um, pediatricians and getting involved in schools and, and uh, poverty and a variety of, of non health issues. If they weren't very strong advocates, then, you know, they were hypocrites in some ways, was the implication. The last SJM meeting, the, the, the theme was advocacy, and it was a very impressive uh, speaker who was basically Gandhi in terms of her, her life career. But she had one slide where she had like sort of a, a ladder of like 10 different ways to become involved, ranging from fairly minimal to being like her in terms of being Gandhi. 
And she made the point that, well, you know, we don't all have to be Gandhi, that you know, we have to figure out, given our interests, our strengths and talents, where do we fit in the continuum, but everyone has to do something in terms of social justice. So I guess in terms of that particular topic of social justice, if you can explain a little bit more in terms of, I guess a little more specific in terms of where you think we should be then, you know, because in some ways you, you took a straw man in terms of the well, existing. I don't think I yeah. took a straw man. So, I mean, I use the voting example as the minimal amount of social advocacy, and we don't do a very good job there. So, you know, I'm not asking for Gandhi. I was asking for something that minimal. But you said I was unfair. I'm using their definition, which was physicians should work actively to eliminate discrimination um, in healthcare, whether based on race, gender, socioeconomic status, ethnicity, religion, or other any other social category. And um, I think that it's demanding too much to ask that everyone do it actively. So I agree with the speaker who said it's all on a continuum and that different people should do different things. But my point is, if you, we really require that, then we're failing, because we can't even get us to vote, let alone get us to actively try to change the system, try to, you know, try to work for the Obamacare <coughs> and trying to get all those people without health insurance. I mean, more physicians are against it than are for it, right? So I think we're failing, and I don't think I'm being too harsh. Well, I guess my concern was, when, when, when you had this slide, I thought you were implying that, well, we shouldn't be actively, whatever actively means, be trying to eliminate discrimination along these different no, uh, lines. I, just don't, I think that if we're going, I, I said that I think this is too lofty an ideal for all of us to be at that level of activism. I'll settle for having all of us vote and take an active interest, right? We can't even get more than 40% of us to vote in any election. When you talk about then what should be done, you know, if you were the charter writers, um, what I'm hearing is that you're thinking that everyone should play their part you know, some people it's going to be public policy. Other is going to be how we treat the individuals in our in our institution, or the policies we create in our institution, or the role modeling we set, and all. Uh, so I think we're on the same page. But the message I heard though was that it's either all or nothing. That you know, you, you either sort of um, you're doing the public policy, or else if you're not doing what you interpret it to be, what the charter meant, then well, you know. That's but that's what the charter is demanding. It's not demanding that it's a team effort and that we as the profession move forward. It's demanding individuals, each one of us, have a personal re responsibility. And it's conflating the personal and the professional. Um, I, I just want to follow up on, on, on Marshall's question. When the WHO defined health as not just the elimination of disease, but a positive state of social, uh, physical, an economic well-being, and I, I didn't quite get it right. It, it was pretty much understood that that definition did not describe the situation on the ground. That was not the way things were, but it was a kind of aspirational vision of how things ought to be in some future time and place. In, in a similar way, I'm wondering if this discussion between you and Marshall uh, doesn't turn on, on what the Charter means. I mean, whether it actually lays down a code of expectations and responsibilities for each and every doc today and forever, or whether it does have some of this aspirational quality to it that that in, in, in the right sort of medical world of the future, where health is social, economic, and physical well-being, these would be the kinds of, the kinds of aspirations that doctors ought to have and, and ought to work towards. So, so it's, a, it's a real difference. So no, it is a real difference. So there are two issues about it. One is that remember that this is being developed for medical education purposes. So this notion that it's a lofty ideal, we'll get back to. But we're supposed to be evaluating and measuring whether they're achieving this. And we haven't, let's talk about the World Health Organization definition. Have we gotten any closer to that definition in the 25 years? If anything, we probably made three steps back. So we're not moving towards there. So lofty ideals are great, but when you have to, quote, measure it and, you know, in, infuse it into your medical students, we're not doing a great job. So one question is, from a, if it's just a behavior, and I don't think it is, but if it's just a behavior, that's one way of responding, that they're talking about behaviors. So if we ignore it as a behavior and then say, well, maybe it's lofty ideals, I still think 
that they're demanding too much of individual physicians. If it's about lofty ideals, it should be about the commitment of the healthcare profession. It shouldn't be about each one of us having these responsibilities. Yeah. Laney, um, one of the observations you made that I think was very important uh, was the sort of rupture, if you will, between ethics and professionalism, or the way in which they are often conceived of in parallel. Um, and I wonder, um, sometimes I've wondered whether or not the modern professionalism movement as currently conceived um, is, uh, came in some ways as a reaction against medical ethics, either conceiving it as saying these are rules of people telling me what to do and I don't want that, uh, or um, a bunch of people abstractly reasoning about cases um, and went off in its own direction. So, so the first question is, um, do you agree that there um, is anything to that theory of how it happened? And um, secondly, regardless of how it happened, do you have any suggestions for bringing ethics and professionalism back together? So I, I, I don't think that's actually how it happened. I, I really think this was sort of a decision was made that we need to incorporate this and the educators who are very clinically competent and ethical people felt they could do this um, and didn't really think about it in the notion of, I mean, I think this wasn't a malicious intent. I think it was just um, sort of obliviousness about the fact that in a sense the three principles, they are never cited as where they came from. They came like mushrooms out of the ground, rather than that there's a whole history of medical ethics in which these principles come from. So I think that's the issue. And I think it's um, a failure on the ethicist's part for um, not sort of engaging as this movement started to take place and saying we can help with this as well. So. From, from what I've, I've heard today, it isn't that hard to figure out what is an unprofessional behavior, at least once it's been committed. But since... <laughs> <laughs> Justice Potter, huh? Yeah. But, but you, you tease me having four months with a, a very brief uh, suggestion of the other side of the so-called supra-professional when you said we're going to have to deal with professionalism and conscience clauses. When is it that it is professional to ignore orthodox medical treatment because of conscience? I don't think it is, and I've written that. So, well, you got some <laughs> argument in this room. I know I do. <laughs> okay. I have a uh, theoretic question. Can you um, define and contrast um, ethics and professionalism as terms and concepts? You know, I actually thought about that a lot the other day, trying to do it. So, in a sense, I would actually argue that um, professionalism is, in a sense, one component of ethics that ethics is sort of the theory of what is right and what is wrong and what is good and right and things of that sort. And professionalism is just looking at it in the particular area of health care. Um, it's not adequate, but I've been thinking about. Um, but I do think they're totally overlapping. The principles we're using are the same, um, and we've just failed to acknowledge that. Now, professionalism also has another component, which is about clinical excellence. Mm -hmm. um, but I would actually argue you could sort of assume that in ethics as well. Right. I, mean, I think that's an important point because from sitting in educating groups, ethics is seen as a subset of professionalism, no. not professional as a subset of ethics. And I think that's, that paradigm shift is part of what I think you're pointing out. Yeah. <clears throat> well, join me in thanking Lainey for, for wonderful <laughs>